welcome back to these uh, sessions on the small catechism that we're taping for ILT's Word at Work series. Uh, we're sort of in the middle part of the catechism, working our way through the Lord's Prayer. And uh, tonight we finish up on the last petitions and then the closing doxology. Now, as we noted at the end of the last session, the rest of the Lord's Prayer addresses spiritual issues, but ones that deeply affect community. And, and how we live together with one another. Starting with the fifth petition, what is the fifth petition? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, in some translations of uh, the Lord's Prayer, you'll find the word debts here instead. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, both meanings are in there. This goes again back to the old language of the King James. And in some ways, I think it's um, more evocative language. It, it's more helpful to think of, of trespasses rather than debts. Um, what does it mean to, whoop, to trespass? If you saw that sign on a fence, what does it mean? Don't, don't, go, over it. don't go over it. You don't cross it. Absolutely. To trespass is to cross a line or to violate a boundary that's been set. It's this far and no farther, and you go there anyway. That means to trespass. Well, that's one way to define what sin is. God has set certain boundaries, and sin is when people keep crossing those boundaries, doing what God has said not to do. Here's uh, the original example of that. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, after God has uh, created uh, Adam, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. There's the boundary. Everything else in the garden is available to you, just not this one tree. You don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's the boundary that God set for Adam and Eve. Now, you move into the next chapter. The serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said, no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it. God didn't actually say that. She's amplifying the rule. Or you shall die. But the servant said, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So we knew what the boundary was. Now, why did Adam and Eve cross it? How did the serpent convince them to cross the boundary, to trespass the line that God had set? To be exalted. You can be like God. In other words, you don't want to be just a creature. That's sort of second rate. You can do better than that. God's holding out on you. He knows that if you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like him. You can be your own God and call your own shots. So one side of sin is wanting to be our own gods rather than creatures not being willing or satisfied to be what God has made us to be. We want more. And so we trespass. We try to cross the line between God and us. It might be by rejecting God and saying, I'm all I need. It might be by trying to earn our way into God's uh, favor. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that we can cross this line, uh, trespass the boundary between God and us. But the, the commonality is always that we try to be more than we were created to be. We aren't content. We aren't satisfied with that. 
So whether it's by ignoring God, trusting on ourselves, setting on our own rules, um, acting as if we're immortal, um, or that what God has said doesn't matter, in all sorts of ways, we try to be more than we were created to be. We trespass the line between God and us. But that's one side of it. There is another expression of sin, and that is failing to be fully human. You know, when we looked at the first start of the creed, we looked at Genesis 1 and saw how people are the crown of creation. We are made in God's image, unlike all the other creatures on earth. We are different as human beings and, and given dominion over the earth. So when we fail to be fully human, it's also trespassing the boundary that God has put around us. If you think here of a target, an archery target, you can miss a target by shooting too high and going over the top of it. You can also miss it by shooting too low and going underneath it. I mean, we are not God, and so we shouldn't be aiming to shoot over the target. That's one way of trespassing the boundary. But we're also not just animals. This has been sort of a fad through the last generation. Every once in a while, people just talk about us as, you know, the animals who walk on two feet. No. Yeah, we're mammals physically, but we're more. We're different than the other animals. We bear God's image. And so we don't undershoot either and act as if we are less than human. What are some ways that people sin by acting like animals instead of humans? By shooting too low. Ignoring relationships. Um, no respect. Pardon? Ignoring God, as if there was no God. The law of the jungle, when we just murder other people, don't care for them. A promiscuity, as you know, very common in the animal world, not supposed to be among humans. Um, when we kill our young, <laughs> animals do that. We're not supposed to. Um, greed, there are all sorts of ways of acting as, li as if life is only about what happens in this world as if we are merely animals with no spiritual aspect to ourselves. And so the fifth petition asks God to keep us on the mark. Not aiming too high, trying to be like God. Not aiming too low, acting just like animals. If you look at the meaning to the fifth petition, it's on page 20 in your small catechisms. What does this mean to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? We pray in this petition that our Heavenly Father would not hold our sins against us and deny our prayers because of them. We know we have not earned nor do we deserve those things for which we pray, but we ask that he would grant us all things through grace, even though we sin every day and deserve nothing but punishment. And so we too will heartily forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. Well, there are two parts to this petition. We ask first that God will not hold our past sins against us. Uh, though we don't deserve forgiveness, that God will nevertheless clear the slate for us. So we repent of our sin and pray God to forgive, not to refuse to Clear our sins away. But you notice the second sentence, that we do not deserve this. We have not earned, nor do we deserve those things for which we pray. I mean, this is a gift, an undeserved, astonishing, astounding gift that God would forgive our sins. Forgiveness is not an entitlement, but it is an astounding, undeserved gift. Now, this is one of those things that I think, as faithful Christians, we need to remind ourselves of. Because every week we confess our sins, hear the absolution. And we can start to think that, well, of course, this is what God does for us. As if somehow it's the most natural thing in the world. And from there, it can be a short step to saying, well, God likes to forgive. We like to sin. We can keep each other very happy here, you know. 
I mean, already in Romans, Paul faced that. Shall we sin the more that grace may abound? And he says, are you kidding me? Uh, don't even think about it. Uh, that's not the idea at all. So the fact that, that as sinners, as sinful creatures who have overshot or undershot the target, we can come before God our Creator and be forgiven rather than punished or destroyed, it's astounding. I mean, it's, it's just an astonishing gift of grace and love from God our Creator. And the only reason we're bold enough to ask for that is because of the promise of Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf. Apart from that, we would hardly dare to do it. So we ask for forgiveness of sins done in the past, and then we look to the future. Ask God to keep giving us all things by His grace. Because we're honest enough to know that our human condition, that original sin within us, is going to keep us sinning and rebelling against God until the day we die. In one way or another, we're just really good at it. And so we ask God to keep forgiving us. Uh, not that we're just, you know, sinning and counting on this as our get out of jail free card. But when, as Paul, you know, last time we looked at Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. When we keep falling into these same old sins, to say, Lord, don't give up on us. Don't lose patience with us. Please continue for Jesus' sake to forgive our sins. Drive us to repent, which means to turn around and go in the other direction. To leave that behind and to live the way you would want us to. And so we saw in the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread, that was a call to trust God to give us all things that we need. Well, it's only God's forgiveness that enables us to trust Him, as the fourth petition calls us to do. Uh, the, these, these petitions are tied together. They don't just stand independently. Uh, it's the forgiveness of the fifth petition that makes us possible for us to trust God as the fourth petition asks us to. But as through the commandments, as through the creed, as through the whole Lord's Prayer, the key issue here is faith. Trust in God. And in fact, going back to our little target, that's the difference between shooting too high and shooting too low. Neither of those express trust or faith in God. To trust God is to be the creatures God made us to be and to be content with that. So sin leads to moral issues. There's no doubt about that. I mean, just read the news every day and there are moral failings left and right. Look in the mirror and you'll probably find a few to boot. But too often, uh, Christians and non-Christians alike define sin solely in terms of moral issues. Moral issues are usually the evidence, not the cause. They're the outcome, not the root problem. The root issue is always this uprising against God. Rebellion against God being our God, and we want to go our own way instead. It's all about faith, about trust. But then the petition goes on. Knowing uh, that God forgives us so freely, we can then do the same with our neighbors. And so it goes on, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, this part of the Lord's Prayer is often, has often, been misunderstood and even feared. What does this mean, as we forgive those who trespass against us? Um, some people, for example, have read as to mean in proportion to. So God will forgive us only as much as we forgive those around us. If you remember the author Robert Louis Stevenson, um, wrote Treasure Island and other great uh, works, um, he refused to pray this petition of the Lord's Prayer because he understood it this way. And he said, if God only forgives me as much as I'm able to forgive others, I am toast. So I'm just not even going to go there. Not going to put myself in that position. 
If God forgives the way that we forgave, we'd probably be condemned. That's not such a good thing. Others understand it in terms of time, in a temporal sense, that uh, God waits to see if we forgive and then forgives us only if we do. We have to go first. It's like God making a deal. I'll forgive if you do, but you go first. Again, everything kicks back on us and depends on us. But remember where we started this whole thing. God made a decision to be your God. He didn't ask first. God doesn't make deals. He doesn't set conditions uh, for forgiveness. God forgives and renews freely for Jesus' sake. Undeserved, unmerited grace. But God does intend for that forgiveness to flow through us to others. That it doesn't just stop here. That it's not a possession we have, but it affects how we deal with others. God pours his forgiveness into us so that it will flow through us to others. And so what as means here is more like at the same time, in the same manner as. Forgive us our trespasses as we at the same time forgive those who trespass against us. As we in the same way forgive those. It starts with God, but then flows through us to others. God's forgiveness empowers us to forgive others in the same way. And that's what God calls us to model in our relationships. is the kind of forgiveness that he first gives to us in wiping away our sin. Plus, that's really the only way to be truly free of the things that have hurt us, of uh, the offenses against us. I mean, you carry a grudge and it just festers. It just eats away at you. When, by the grace of God, you can let it go. You can forgive the sin of others. It frees you as well as the other person. It really is what makes all the difference. Only as we forgive can we truly be free of whatever the problem is. Just as we can only be free of our sin as God forgives us and wipes the slate clean. Jesus told a powerful parable to show this. Again, it's too long to put on the screen, but if you turn in the New Testament to Matthew chapter 18, We're going to start at verse 23. Matthew 18, verse 23. Jesus said, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, we don't deal in talents anymore, but understand this is an absurd amount of money. In our day, it would probably be billions of dollars. You're not, not even sure how a guy could rack up debts like this, okay? It's just an incredible amount of money. Uh, so, um, as he could not pay, surprise, surprise, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. That is, they would be sold as economic slaves and whatever little piddly amount he got would go against the debt. Wouldn't make much difference, but some. So the slave fell on his knees before the king, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Yeah, in how many lifetimes, buddy, um, on a debt like this? But, verse 27, out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him, forgave him the debt. Just imagine, billions of dollars. And it's like, now nah, just write it off. I mean, this is one very wealthy king. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Yeah, maybe 50 bucks. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and re uh, reported to their Lord all that had taken place. 
And his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. Eh, pretty much forever. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Gulp. I mean, that last verse is a very real threat. Um, we cannot take this call to forgive as we have been forgiven lightly. This is uh, how God creates the community he wants among his people. As we pray, as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's not a casual commitment. But there is no need for fear or terror here either. Because, just like the king, God freely forgives us first of all of our sin, of our enormous debt to him. And then being, having been freed and rescued and delivered by him, then we're equipped to be gracious to others. I mean, when we think about what God is willing to let go on our account, how can we fail to let things go on the account of others? I mean, it's not only the, the seriousness of that threat to the end, we need to do this, but it's also the graciousness of the king to let such an enormous debt go. And so the point of the parable is the same as the fifth petition. God's forgiveness doesn't depend on our forgiving others. He doesn't withhold it to see how we're going to do. God pours out his forgiveness on us freely, but then expects that we forgive others in the same way. That we let that flow through us to others and not treat it as a personal possession. In the large catechism, Luther wrote, Inasmuch as we sin greatly against God every day, and yet he forgives it all through grace. We must always forgive our neighbor who does us harm, violence, and injustice. If you do not forgive, do not think that God forgives you. But if you forgive, you have the comfort and assurance that you are forgiven in heaven. Not on account of your forgiving, for God does it altogether freely. But out of pure grace, because he has promised it, as the gospel teaches. As we don't earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others, but if we fail to forgive, we can forfeit the gift, just as the slave in the parable did, um, by, by treating God's forgiveness as our personal possession rather than our way of life and the means to build Christian community. All right. Well, with that, we move on to the sixth petition, which is what? Lead us not into temptation. Now again, we need to make sure we know what these words mean as we're praying them. What is temptation? Well, it has two different aspects to it, or two different sides to it. One, of course, and perhaps the more common one that we think of, is the desire to do what we know is wrong. But it looks so good. It's so promising. Um, this is one of the great lies of sin, is that it promises so much and delivers so very little. <laughs> yeah, there's sometimes a small delivery, enough to keep us coming back, but it never does what it promises. But the other way, uh, side of temptation is to experience trials of some kind that, that test our faith and make us wonder whether God is with us, is real, is packed up and gone to some other universe, um, that threatens our faith in him. Now, it's really important to understand that temptation is not the same as sinning. Temptation is the desire to do wrong. Sinning is actually doing it. I mean, we're all tempted as Christians. In fact, Luther said that as, as Christians, we're probably more tempted than unbelievers because we have a higher sense of what's wrong and right and what God wants from us. And, and the devil can use that very cleverly to say, oh, yeah, but look how good this is. 
You really do want that? There you go. Uh, just like bait. And we know what we should do even if we don't want to do it. It's possible that unbelievers struggle less with their conscience. But in any case, temptation isn't the same as giving in and doing the deed. And so besides asking for forgiveness in the fifth petition, we also pray not to be tempted. But given that difference, does that seem a little backward to you? I mean, if temptation is the desire to sin but not the same as sinning, sinning is actually giving in temptation and doing the deed, wouldn't you think you'd pray not to be tempted first? And then if we blow it, um, then forgive our sins when we do it? The desire comes before the deed. Um, but there's an important reason that these petitions come in the order that they do. And that is that, if we, as we've seen before, sin is not only what we do or even what we fail to do. Sin isn't only a matter of actions, but it's also a part of who we are from birth. It's part of our human condition. We are born into sin. And so it's only as we're forgiven that we actually know and learn what sin is. Only in recognizing sin do we know what temptation is. And because sin is a part of who we are, we need forgiveness from day one. And as we receive that, then we learn what it means to be tempted. For example, um, small children, toddlers, will just wander out in the street without a second thought. They have no idea they're putting themselves in harm's way. It's only as mom freaks out and goes running after them and hauls them back on the grass and says, don't you ever do that again. It's like, oh, there's a boundary there. But then what will they do? They'll do it again. Or they'll go right up to the curb and make sure mom's looking and then go, is she going to come and get me again? I mean, you learn what temptation is through the experience of sin. And so it's only in, in recognizing what sin is that we come to know what temptation means. And so there's a reason that we pray first, forgive us our trespasses, then we pray, lead us not into temptation. But now as we think about temptation, it is really important to understand what it actually is. The culture that we live in portrays uh, temptation as just doing some harmless fun, a little bit of self-indulgence, having the chocolate for Pete's sake. You know, I mean, what's it really going to hurt? Um, if you look at, at where the word temptation is used culturally, it's almost always to make something look really appealing. I mean, I don't think they make it anymore, but there used to be a whole line of dessert mixes called sweet temptations. But they were diet. I mean, the point was you can give in. This is, a, this is a temptation you can give in to and it won't hurt you. The whole goal is to give in to temptation because it's just harmless fun. Um, I mean, seriously, how is uh, chocolate or uh, sex or stealing or cheating gonna, really going to hurt us in the long run? You know, just relax a little bit. But that desperately underestimates the reality and the seriousness of temptation. I mean, to find out what temptation really is, think back to, to Genesis 3 that we read a while ago. Um, what was the temptation for Adam and Eve? To be like God. To cross that trespass line and eat the forbidden fruit because that would make them like God. So the, the, the presenting issue is this tree they're not supposed to eat of and this fruit that has been set off limits. But the underlying issue is what Satan says, the serpent says, it will do for them, that they will be like God. So instead of trusting God, they're tempted to rebel against God. I mean, if you remember, Eve wasn't confused about the rule. I mean, she even amplified it. We can't eat of it or even touch the tree or we're going to die. I mean, the serpent has already got her thinking that God's the bad guy here. 
Yeah, we can't even, oh, we can't even touch it. But she's not confused about the rule. She knows what it is. She just wasn't convinced of the rule, that it was a good thing. And the servant said, you can be more. You can be like God. And she dived in. And so uh, this is a really important passage for understanding the nature of temptation because the serpent used a three kind of sneaky moves to uh, convince Eve to eat of the fruit and to cross the trespass line. First, in chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent asked that um, intriguing question, did God say? Did God really say you can't eat of any of these trees in the garden? Well, of course, God said nothing of the kind. But what the serpent does in asking that is that he casts doubt on God's word. He gets Eve to thinking about it. Well, now let's see. What did God say? Hmm. Well, no, 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 no. That wasn't it. He just said not to eat of the one tree and not to touch it either. I guess he is kind of a hard case, you know. Well, then in verse 4, serpent said to the woman, you will not die. Well, God had said that. Eve knew it. But servant says, nah. He contradicted God's word. Cast doubt on it. And then he contradicted it. And then in verse 5, he makes that utterly false promise. If you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like so he substituted uh, a false promise of his own for God's word. Cast doubt on the word, contradicted the word, and then swapped it out for a false promise of his own. And this three-step plan of temptation shows what the end goal always is, no matter what the presenting cause might be. The real goal of temptation is always to destroy faith in God, to turn us in on ourselves, to turn us away from trusting God as creatures that he has made. And so temptation is not a matter of harmless indulgence or giving in, you know, uh, going off your diet a little bit. It's way more serious than just lightening up and relaxing about the rules. It, at, at, at the base level, it always encourages, not, encourages us not to love, trust, and obey God, as the first commandment calls us to do. And so temptation separates, from, separates us from God, makes us doubt God as our good and loving creator. And sadly, you see exactly this happen in Genesis 3, after the part that we read earlier. The eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They'd never had that sense of, of shame uh, or awareness before. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. I mean, he'd always been naked. But now he feels guilt and shame and fear of God. A desire to run rather than to be in God's presence. So in this uh, deeply ironic, tragic way, yeah, they now know what is good and evil. But it doesn't make them like God at all. It drives them away from God, divides them from God. They doubt God's love, fear his punishment, um, fall into uh, uh, enmity between one another. They start pointing fingers at each other. And so the, the end result of temptation is deadly serious. And it's always meant to do exactly this, to destroy our faith and trust in God and divide us. Well, in the same way as Adam and Eve, the devil also wants us to doubt God, to try to be our own gods, to fall into despair 
anything other than to trust, fear, and love God as we're called to do. And that's because the devil's ultimate aim is death, not life. God is the creator and sustainer of life. The devil, as this opposing force, wants death, uh, destruction, despair. And so by luring us away from God, who is the source of life, <laughs> the devil wins. Even if, and I, you, don't have, you can talk about a spiritual death here, not a physical death, even if it doesn't kill us. If it separates us from God, it puts us spiritually to death. And we are like Adam and Eve, hiding from God, fearing God, um, ashamed in God's presence. And so it's really a dangerous for us to make sin, our temptation, and the sin that we give into seem trivial. No big deal. Doesn't really hurt anything. God is not a spoil sport who doesn't want us to have any fun. But rather, God knows that sin divides us from him divides us and leads to death. So look at the meaning to the sixth petition in the small catechism on page 21. God indeed tempts no one to sin, but we pray in this petition that God would grant and protect us from this, that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or lead us into false belief, despair, and other great and shameful sins. But pray that when we are tempted in these ways, we may finally prevail and gain the victory. Now note that unlike the meaning to daily bread, Luther includes no long list of sins here. This, this, you know, don't tempt us to all these different things. Instead, he zeroes in on the great and shameful sins. And what are they? Pardon? No, according to the meaning. What are the, what are the great and shameful sins that he names? One is false belief and despair. False belief would be basically idolatry, not trusting God's word, trusting some other word. Despair is to have no hope, to believe that God is against us and not for us. This is where temptation leads to false belief and despair. And that's what makes them great and shameful. I mean, these are the real sins. These are the serious sins because they are the opposite of faith in God. The mirror image of trusting God. Um, and so temptation and sin eventually destroy that belief that God has decided to be our God and divides us from him as it did Adam. And so in that light, the sixth petition has two parts to it. We pray first that we will not be tempted into those great and shameful sins of false belief and despair and the like. But then, knowing that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, we ask God to save us when, in fact, we do go exactly there. <laughs> when we do fall into such temptation and sin when we give in or when it sneaks up on us or in some other way, we end up um, wallowing in sin. Then don't give up on us. Continue to forgive us. But besides this prayer, um, God also provides help to fight off temptation. And the key here is to follow Jesus' example Again, this is too long to put on the screen, but if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, this is one of the two accounts of Jesus' temptation. Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. When they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. 
Then the devil led him up and showed him on, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will just worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Well, at a time of extreme distress, no food for 40 days, living out in the wilderness, um, and this is a, a dry, desert, rocky kind of place. Uh, whenever we say wilderness, conformants draw pine trees. They think of the boundary waters. This, this isn't the boundary waters. This is desert, uh, rocky, uh, miserable terrain. And the devil comes with three very appealing temptations. Food, wealth and power, and the adoration of, of uh, the people as they see that he is... God's own son as the angels rescue him. Very appealing temptations, but to give in to any one of them would have changed Jesus' loyalty from God to Satan. It would have destroyed everything. And so in the face of each one of these temptations, what did Jesus do? He quotes the Old Testament. Actually, all three come out of the book of Deuteronomy. He relied on God's word. Not on his own wisdom, not on his own strength, not on his willpower. He went back again and again and again to God's word. So rather than trying to fight it on his own, even Jesus, the son of God, didn't try to fight it on his own. He used the resources God has provided. But note, as we read through that text, that God did not come swooping in to rescue Jesus from this temptation. He had to endure it. And the truth is that God likely won't rescue us either from times of temptation. But what he will do is strengthen us, to protect us, to help us to endure, to get through it, to keep our faith. And we have the word of God to rely on, to lean on just as Jesus Now, people say, well, why wouldn't God rescue us? I mean, the meaning says God doesn't lead anyone into temptation. No, but it's just a part of life in this world. Same reason the serpent shows up in the Garden of Eden. People say, well, why did God bother creating the serpent if he's going to cause all this trouble? But the point is that faith in God implies the possibility of unfaith, of unbelief. Uh, to trust involves at least the possibility of not trusting. That's what the serpent represents. Not just Satan, but the whole possibility of, of rebelling and not trusting God. That's a part of life in this world because God wants real relationships with us. But just as that's a reality, so God has given us the tools we need to endure, to fight back, uh, not to fall into sin. So we use the word, we use the sacraments, and through them God strengthens us. All right, well, knowing that Satan is tempting us to destroy our faith, we then pray the seventh petition, which is what? Deliver us from evil. Look at the meaning on page 21. We pray in this petition, as in a summary, that our Heavenly Father would deliver us from every type of evil, whether it affects our bodies or souls, property or reputation. And at last, when our hour of death comes, would grant us a blessed end to our earthly lives and graciously take us from this world of sorrow to himself in heaven. Now, evil here means both bad um, actions, experiences, but also the evil one. 
Satan, who tempts in order to get us to sin. Everything that opposes God's will is in this petition. Um, and it's because Satan works against everything that we've prayed for up until now. He tries to undermine God's name and to keep his kingdom from coming and prevent his will from being done and that we don't get daily bread, uh, that we don't receive forgiveness or forgive others, that we are led into temptation. And so in this petition, we ask God to protect us from Satan, to preserve our faith in Jesus and his promises, to keep us obedient to him. In this life, as we live day by day, and then we pray for final, total deliverance from evil at the end. Now today, some people will hear that uh, last request. At the last, uh, hour, when our hour of death comes, um, uh, grant us a blessed end to our earthly lives. Graciously take us to your soul in heaven. Some people may hear that as sort of morbid. You know, why are we... Uh, praying about our own death, that somehow it's world-denying. No, 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 it's the final promise. That one day, the temptation's going to end. One day, the sin will be no more. One day, there will be no more struggle. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And so we pray both for this world, but then for that time when finally the struggle is over. I mean, I think this is one of the truly beautiful parts of the Catechism, that our last hour, you would mercifully take us from the sorrows of this world to yourself in heaven. Now, it is appropriate that this petition, deliver us from evil, comes last. Um, actually, two reasons for it. First, if God delivers us from evil, then the rest of the prayer can happen. I mean, if evil doesn't get a hold of us, then... God's name will be hallowed. His kingdom will come. His will will be done. We'll receive our daily bread. And evil, if it's contained, all these other things can happen. But on the flip side, in order for God to deliver us from evil, the rest of the prayer must happen. I mean, if, if we're going to be delivered from evil, God's name has to be hallowed among us. His kingdom has to come among us. His will must be done for us. We must receive our daily bread and forgiveness of sins, be rescued from temptation. So it's almost circular. Um, to be delivered from evil allows all these things to happen, and all these things have to happen in order for God to deliver us from evil. So this, uh, Luther calls this last, summary, uh, uh, last petition a summary, because it does. It sums up the whole prayer. It includes everything else. Uh, and, and just uh, draws it all together in one last petition, leaving nothing out. So everything else that we pray for is encompassed in this last petition, deliver us from evil. Now, because of that, it makes sense that Jesus ended his prayer here. Uh, two sessions ago, we looked at the two accounts of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke, and we noticed that uh, they both ended at this point. But there are good reasons why the church added the ending that we use. On page 22 in the Catechism, it's called The Conclusion. Um, that was not my choice. That was an editor who put that in there. Um, more often, it's called The Doxology. And I think that's a much better name. Doxology means a word of praise. And that's how the, the church decided this prayer should end, is with a word of praise for all of these promises and everything that they uh, declare to us. And this particular word of praise includes two confident proclamations. First, we pray, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And here again, using that old Elizabethan word for yours, thine instead, creates this, this important rhyme with mine. I mean, the old Adam wants to pray, mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not thine. And, and as we use that older language, it just reminds us, whoops, yeah, not mine, but 
thine, yours, O Lord. So to say thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory puts ourselves to death. We, we die to ourselves and give all that glory to God. It puts us under God's rule and, and pray that we conform our lives to Christ, that these petitions will be done for us and in us. But then we also pray, Amen. And this is where the meaning in the catechism focuses. Again, if you look on page 22. What does this mean? It means that I should be certain that such petitions are acceptable to our Heavenly Father and are heard by Him. For He Himself has commanded us to pray in this manner and has promised to hear us. And so we pray with confidence, Amen, meaning, yes, it shall be so. Yes, it shall be so. Everything we've prayed for. That God is our Heavenly Father, that his name will be hallowed, his kingdom will come, his will will be done. Everything for which we have prayed shall happen. And so we can pray the Lord's Prayer confidently, without fear or doubt, because God himself has commanded us to pray in this manner and promised to hear us. Again, this is the Lord's Prayer, the very words Christ gave us to pray. And so we can be confident that God accepts this prayer and hears it and will answer it. So in the large catechism, Luther says, this doxology at the end is an unquestioning affirmation of faith on the part of one who knows that God does not lie because he has promised to grant these requests. And where such faith is absent, there can be no true, true prayer. And there too makes the doxology so important. Because it, it clings to the promise that God will do what he has promised to do. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And of course, because God has promised such faith to us, it's not absent, but it's assured. Not on our doing, but by the grace of God, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, anchoring us in Jesus Christ. And so we pray with confidence. Amen. Yes, it shall be so.